I know my other reason. Yeah, no, I know. So he's like really leaning heavily on the contracting side of things. It's like it's hard for us to get institutional knowledge yeah. when um, you know we and just, hold on to the yeah. 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 We'll see. I'm optimistic, but Good morning, everybody. Uh, we're going to get started here. This is the, uh, the February Solid Waste Advisory Committee meeting, and uh, we'll start with a review and approval of the January meeting minutes. Hold on. Oh, are you recording, Sue? Yes, they are. They are. Can we do? Oh, oh. well, that, that was. Uh, um, oh, it was on the agenda. I'm sorry. It's <laughs> all right. Okay. All right. So I uh, do a, a quick roll call here. Uh, City Assistant Paul Bertagna. Jared Black, Luke Dines, Ed Fitch, Keith Caceres, Cassie Lacey, Cassie is here, thank you Cassie, uh, Ron Shearer for Public Services. Yeah, I'm here Chad. Thank you Ron. Chris Ogren, thank you Chris. Mike Riley, thank you, Mike. Uh, Roman Guffey, who's alternate for uh, uh, Cascade Disposal, and Robin Vora. Okay, we have a quorum here, so thank you all those for attending. Um, uh, next is a uh, review and approval of January meeting minutes. Do we have any comments on the, the minutes from the January meeting? Okay, no comments. Uh, uh, for a motion to accept as published. I'll make a motion. Hey, Chris Ogren motions, second. Keith Caceres. Yes, seconds. Um, any discussion? Okay, um, meeting minutes are, are approved. Thank you. Uh, next is uh, public comments. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I am not good at Robert's rule of order. Um, so uh, vote to approve the minutes from the uh, January Solid Waste Advisory Committee meeting. Aye. All, all opposed? Any opposed? Okay. Minutes passed. Thank you. I need a, I need a cue card for Robert's rule of order. I apologize. Um, so uh, next on the agenda is public comments. So uh, how many people do we have in the audience that are going to be commenting? Okay, we have, we have a few here. I, th I think it's on. I, I can hear myself. Yeah. Um, we have, do we have the list, Andy? I'll, I'll call people up according to the uh, the list here. I, yeah, I tried pushing it around. It, it's, I think I can hear myself on the speaker. Okay. All right. Uh, the first for public comment is, is Matthew Hyman. Matt? Uh, hi, my name is Matthew Hyman. I just wanted to thank you guys for all your hard work in this process. I know it's a difficult one and for fielding uh, not only my emails, many of them, but everyone else's emails too. So thank you. Um, I just wanted to make a few comments um, of concern about the sites in the Millican Valley, uh, 1914003300, which I think is still on the list, and uh, 2015003300. These is the Pine Mountain Road kind of what I've been calling that one. The other one, the Ford Road, these are both in the Millican Valley. Um, I just uh, have a concern about these particular sites. Uh, a few things being, um, they're very close to the highway. I know in some of the previous uh, sites that had been nixed from the list, one of the main things was that they were too visible and close to the highways. Um, I sent an email about some of this and I just had noticed that and I was wondering if that was going to be applied to some of the same criteria as these sites. Um, they're highly visible in the Millican Valley. There's no tree cover or mountain or terrain cover at all. It's a big open flat plain full of sagebrush. And so, I mean, it's a beautiful place you can see for 80, 100 miles. So as you're driving Highway 20, if you can imagine a landfill being right on the side of the highway, that's what you're going to see. Um, you know, the high visibility, I think, should mix these locations off the list. If you're on the top of Pine Mountain recreating, the first thing you're going to see is the landfill at the base of uh, the valley there instead of the mountains and Mount Hood and everything. And you're likely going to be up there with your children visiting the observatory. You know, this is a high recreation zone. There's a lot of valley from 
uh, paragliders, hikers, mountain bikers. Um, there's the shooting ranges out there. There's all the OHB off-road trails, the stargazing. I mean, it's a real asset for the county to preserve this area. Um, it seems quite far away from Bend. When you get out there, you feel like you're a million miles away, but you're actually, it's really quite close. And I think that's a big asset to the county to preserve this area for that recreation. It's already been established as a huge recreation area and the landfills right in the middle of it. It's just not a good idea. Um, other things, it is along the Brothers Fault Zone, as I've uh, read a little bit about the geology of the area. The, the fault zone runs along highway turning from Bend to the Steam Mountains. So there's some potential site issues there as well. Um, it being in an open area like that, the wind can get out of control. And wind and trash, as we know, can be uh, problematic for controlling where this stuff is going to happen. The weather is quite different in the Millican Valley compared to Bend because there's an elevation change and because the terrain and topography is so different. The temperatures are much colder and the wind can be quite vicious. And so having a landfill in an open space with lots of wind, um, it just isn't making sense. Um, that and the high visibility, uh, you know, it, it's all adding up not to be a good idea. You would see this stuff from the top of um, like Newberry National Park, you know, from the crater rim, you'll see the landfill. You know, this is like one of our two national parks in the, in the state. So I think we do need to think it, about the big picture of where this thing's going to be, if we can hopefully hide it and put it somewhere where it's just a little less visible. We do have to put it somewhere, of course, but um, these little spots in Millican are just not the best choice. The other last thing I'd like to point out um, is especially for 191.14 and for uh, the Pine Mountain one, there's some cultural heritage sites very close at the top of the Dry River Canyon. There's uh, known pictographs that have been notated in books and cultural history uh, books have shown these pictographs at the top of the canyon. If you look on the map right with the, in a mile of there is TP Draw is written on the map. It's TP Draw. Like it's called TP Draw because it's a cultural heritage site. It's been water has run through that course. It's run down the Dry River Canyon. There were steelhead, there were salmon, there were native cultures living here. There's artifacts galore out in this area where we're trying to put a proposed land site and TP draw. That just doesn't make a lot of sense from a cultural heritage perspective. Right near the Pine Mountain site uh, is the Millican Well is right there. And this is the one place where you would stop as you were getting your obsidian from Glass View just to the east. All the natives would come and they'd stop at the Millican Well, Arrowhead Draw, before heading farther west into the mountains. And um, this has been cited by Connolly as a famous archaeologist from the University of Oregon. He found the sandals in the Fort Roth Valley. And these are some of the oldest cultural artifacts that have been found for human existence in North America. And in his uh, essay, he talks about how the Milken Valley has identical cultural history to the Fort Roth Valley. You know, so, and this is right next door to Bend, Oregon, this wonderful place that everybody wants to be in right here just to the east is this cultural heritage spot that we kind of yet to recognize. But a hundred years in the future, we're gonna definitely want to preserve this area and look back and be like, we're glad that we didn't put the landfill in this area. So I would just want to thank you guys for putting in your hard work and giving me time to uh, let you know some of these facts. And I hope that you uh, consider them and oppose these sites in the middle of the valley. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Sue, so can we scroll the, uh, the slideshow? <laughs> one, too, one too many. Uh, next on the list is uh, Dr. Andrew Austin. I'm actually the chief petitioner for the exploration of Milliken into Mountain View, which would establish its own zoning and city ordinances. 
Um, I'm strongly opposed to the sites in Milliken for all the same reasons that were just mentioned. Um, another thing I feel like it's very important no matter where the film site is located, um, it's, um, it's more in depth study of the public concern. I've done a lot of research in that field as well. Um, more in the short, more in the line with how deep contaminants can go into the ground and contaminate aquifers, which can go miles and miles connect to where in Milligan higher than Ben, so it could potentially contaminate um, Ben's aquifers as well. Um, not going? It is recording. It's, it works. Um, you know, attention to light. In the recent uh, microplastic studies that have been shown to travel hundreds of miles from dump sites and other plastic sources. Um, so those are my main concerns. If you're interested in knowing more about the petition for incorporation or would like to sign it, you can contact me. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Austin. Uh, Steve Wright. Good morning. My name is Steve Wright. Um, been in Deschutes County since 1998, and I own property in Milliken and a small cabin out there. Um, I want to thank you guys for all your hard work on this process and for um, eliminating the uh, three sites there, um, Redmond. Uh, and the Rickard Road, and also the Bear Creek Road near the COI property. I'm sure all those people are very happy that this is not put in their backyard. <clears throat> also, the uh, the Juniper Air Park that is right next to that COI property. I'm sure the pilots are very happy that they don't have um, a landfill coming into their area. So. Um, I'm here to speak mostly about Milliken, um, being that uh, I do have property out there. I personally know about 30 landowners out there, and I've been talking with them um, about this, and um, none of them want this landfill in the area. They're all against it um, for the obvious reasons. Um, um, they'll be adversely affected There's also another hundred tax lots out there um, that these those people um, are maybe living out of the area. They don't know about this process, so they don't know about proposed landfill. Um, one thing that all the 30 people I personally know uh, as landowners and all these people have in common is that they all purchased their properties before this proposed landfill issue came into um, effect. So um, just wanna say, please consider the location of the existing uh, private landowners before you select a site. Um, this past Saturday, I was out there at Pine Mountain and uh, it was very enjoyable to watch the uh, seven paragliders flying above Pine Mountain. Um, they've been flying out there for 30 years since probably the 90s. The hang gliders have been flying out there since the 1980s. Um, they've established these flying areas over Pine Mountain, over Milliken. And um, there's no doubt that the landfill is going to change a lot of the air currents in that area. And um, it's not going to be good for the flyers. Also, the, um, there's a little airport there, Millican Airport. It's by the Millican store. And this has been used as a landing zone for the hang gliders, again, since the 1980s. Um, this airport is on the Deschutes County owned land and which is um, part of the proposed site, the 20 
15,00300, the Roth property. So um, essentially, you know, you're overlaying a proposed landfill on, on top of an established, you know, flying area. And, uh, you know, like I said previously, the uh, I'm glad that the uh, Juniper Air Park is not going to be affected by this. Um, now, I did read uh, some public comments um, about uh, there was an attorney that put a letter in that spoke about the Juniper Air Park, and it was um, in the dial system, in the county dial system, that airport has the uh, um, the airport safety overlay zone on it, and uh, there was a lot of uh, legal references in there um, about how that zone protects the airport and the community around it. Well, so the Millican Airport also has the same um, airport safety overlay zone on it through the dial system. I've looked it up, and so you know, it's there to protect the, the the airport, the pilots, and the surrounding community. And so that needs to be taken into account, as well as all the paragliders that use this Pine Mountain. It's a very special place. Uh, it's, they don't fly a lot of other places in Central Oregon. That's the main site. The other last just couple things I want to say is about the wildlife and um, within the last couple years there's been a bunch of juniper trees cut it was just south of the Roth property the 2015-00300 um, and I'm pretty sure they were all on BLM lands and they and I assume the reason all the juniper trees are cut is because they're trying to increase the habitat for the the birds there, the um, the sage grouse. Okay, so at the one hand you're trying to increase the sage grouse, and I'm fine with that. But then on the other hand, you want to bring in a proposed landfill. It's there's two opposing um, things there. Also, um, there are the OHV trails out there, which are the uh, off highway vehicle trails for motorcycles, quads, jeeps. Um, and there's different areas, there's different uh, zones for um, these. And, and what in the South Millican zone, which is the area that's just directly south of Highway 20, that area is only open four months out of the year for riders. And it's, it's open. Uh, it's open for August 1st to November 30th, and then it's closed, you know, for those other eight months. And I'm fairly sure the reason is for the wildlife, the deer, the antelope, the sage grouse, okay? There's a few elk now and then. Um, so, you know, there's wildlife out there. So really in closing, I just want to say, please, no landfills in Millican. And I thank you for your hard work and effort. Thank you, Mr. Wright. Uh, Daniel Baca. Hi, everybody. Daniel Baca again. Uh, thank you. Um, just want to say thank you very, very much for all your guys' hard work you guys have been doing, especially um, the five mile safety corridor you guys implemented. Um, this is thank you for putting people's health, people's safety first um, at the forefront of your guys' thoughts. Um, I have something I want to give you guys. Oh, fun. So what I'm handing out to you guys is a map of not landfill. And this shows you guys how far one quarter mile is. From the time you guys hit the scales at not landfill, this is how far a quarter mile is. You don't even make it to the shed 
where you dump all your waste out. Um, this is how far you can put a landfill from somebody's house, somebody's well. Um, it's only a quarter mile. Uh, this is a rule that's been in place since the 1970s. And I think that this should change. Uh, at the least, what is, if you were to say, hey, parametrics, what does it look like if we were to change our sites to showcase a half a mile or one mile? What would that do to the sites? Because that would do a lot for these people that have homes and wells next to where they eat, live, and drink. Um, so uh, that's that's why I'm here. You know, that's why I've been talking to you guys this whole time. This is it's quarter miles too close. You gave three miles for sage grouse and five miles for airports, and that's wonderful and that's astounding, and that shows that you care. And I think we can make that a little bit different. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Baca. James Buzin. Morning, everyone. My name is uh, James Buzian. I'm the president of Preserve East Bend. I'm also, it's a nonprofit. I'm also a landowner uh, here in Deschutes County. And I have uh, four process questions. So hopefully it'll go pretty quick. And I too, thank you for all your hard work. I know it's going to be a long slog and you got a few more years to go. So thank you. Uh, the first one is, and I may have missed it on the website, is there a design of this facility? Uh, I looked online and uh, you know, I've seen state-of-the-art ones fully enclosed, and then there's usually some language describing all the side processes, you know, manage methane gas, here's where the recyclables. Do you have a design? Let me, let me start with um, a response here in general. So uh, we're, we're taking comments, not questions, um, but I, I will answer your questions in general, but please keep in mind we are we are we are uh, taking comments, not questions at this point. If you do have specific questions, I suggest you submit them in writing. Um, as, as far as design, that's a very site-specific uh, item. So um, we we do not have designs that are specific for each site. That the cost of doing that, it, you know, we we get to that point when we do um, when we, when we do the, the 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 final design here. I'm sorry, somebody was pointing at something here. Oh, okay. So anyway, James, um, okay, there is no there is no site specific design at this point. All right. So I'll turn my questions into comments then. Great. Yeah. Thank you. All right. You're welcome. Uh, I believe you should uh, consider redoing the site surveys, uh, how those were constructed. I've heard uh, comments on uh, they're statistically valid. I'm not sure what that language exactly means. Five hundred people out of two hundred and ten thousand. Uh, then there's uh, you've received some letters from community members uh, doing a really nice analysis of some of the structural problems that people believe are in that site survey. And I'll give you one. The survey asked the question about uh, gasoline and diesel and greenhouse gases and the implication that this will cause a problem if trash is hauled. However, the state of Oregon in 2035 is outlawing the sale and purchase of new gas and diesel vehicles. So question comes to mind, are you going to be buying used vehicles and essentially flying in the face of the spirit of that law? Or uh, are you going to consider electric vehicles or train or some other option? The survey does not give the reader of the survey that option, that information. So there's just one flaw for you. Um, the last uh, comment, and because I can't turn one of my questions into a comment, my fourth one, um, is, is there any reconsideration now uh, with the information you have that people are really struggling with the sites you've thus far identified in Deschutes County? And I know you today are going to talk about other alternate sites. I've heard some state land being discussed and some BLM land. I'm hoping that'll be identified today where those sites are. But uh, multi-county, regional, multi-state, uh, especially if really your window now is 2030 to you'd like to have this, but you do have methodology to extend what you're doing at Knott's Landsville. So potentially you could have a seven to 10 year window, which would give you some time to negotiate 
with multiple counties and multiple states. So I'd like you to consider that. Um, if Deschutes County ends up not being feasible, why not think in the more progressive, um, forward-thinking way? I would encourage you to consider that. Thank you. So, I, yes, sir. I'd love to hear your other question. I think part of what Chad's saying is we're not necessarily going to answer them today. Oh, but you can comment yeah. whatever you want. <laughs> Right, just to be clear, it's okay for you to ask questions. We just maybe not are not going to spend time answering. Oh, okay. Thanks. Well, thank you. Yeah. All right, thank you. Well, then the last one, and I'll be brief here. Um, it, again, relates to process. So uh, I came on board late because you know in early eighteen nineteen when I believe this started, I just wasn't aware. So, for example, Parametric seems to be doing great work. Uh, however, I'm curious: uh, was it a sole source selection or an RFP? That went out. I couldn't find anything online. I can answer that one directly. It was a, it was a public procurement process. We we did this in my career. This was probably the most detailed and extensive consultant selection process I'd ever been through, and I've been doing this for almost forty years. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. That was it. Thank you. All right. Have a great morning. Thank you, James. Um, Frankie Watson. Good morning. I sent you this email this morning, but I felt the need to come and read it. Um, I understand you won't answer questions, but I think the questions will speak for themselves. <laughs> There's a lot of good reasons why uh, Lancho Phil shouldn't be put in the Millican Valley. And I think you've probably heard them all. I will address the aquifer and the Millican Valley and drought. Our governor has declared Crook County and Jefferson County in a drought emergency through Executive Order 23-05. Quote from the governor, Central Oregon has been facing persistent drought for years due to climate change, which brings a higher risk of wildfires and water shortage. Our state needs to get serious about water resolution moving forward, unquote. Deschutes County Commissioners take up a resolution tomorrow to declare a state of emergency and request a state declaration of drought emergency. It is not just Oregon, but 41% of the United States is suffering from drought. The meaning of drought is water shortage. Do any of you know what goes into a landfill on a daily basis? Obviously, the answer is no. Can you can any of you say 100% that the Millican Valley Aquifer will not be contaminated by this landfill? I think my point is made. Please do the right thing for the future of Central Oregon. I beg you to save the water and manage the future properly. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Watson. Uh, Dennis Le Legelman, is that correct? Lohman, I'm sorry. Mine were also in the form of questions. So as this gentleman did, I'll refer to uh, comments. And the comment is the survey that was originally done, I'm assuming somewhere back in 18 or 19, it's difficult to find. I can't find a copy of it. But I'm in total agreement with the gentleman before me that stated that maybe we ought to really think about before we proceed further with this, redoing that survey, because a lot of people didn't even know that survey was being put out. And I think now with all the attention that's been brought up with this landfill, it'd be good to take another look at doing a new survey in order to move forward with possible new site selections or the current sites that are still available. The other is the Commissioner DeBone has stated in two meetings that it's more cost effective to have the landfill in Blaine or in Deschutes County than to think about trucking it out. And I would like to see that cost study because I, I, I'm just not sure that that cost study that was done, again, I'm assuming back in 18 or 19, maybe even before, 
is flawed with all the changes and everything that's occurred since that point in time. I think you're really making this decision on outdated information. As a typical rule, you'll find in the, the report by permits, they say that the landfill should be to make it 100 years most effective. The cost is not only starting it, but at the end of the life to cover it up. And the numbers that are thrown out in there are 300 to 600 acres, not 250. I understand the 250 is the minimum that was established by some study based upon the amount of rubbish that is going to be coming into this landfill over 100 years. And you need 250 to bury it. You then need X number of acres based on current zoning for the buffer around it. If you look at the numbers when not was put in, not's about 200 acres, if I'm correct. 143. 143, that even makes it even that. But the population of Deschutes County back then was about 29,000. Today, it's 204. Not landing or not made it for... 50 years, maybe we can push it to 60. I would suggest that 250 as a minimum to go for 100 years is not sustainable. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lippman. Um, Steve Pear. Uh, yeah. I don't know whether I feel like Reno or Custer. Uh, I think I'm the only one advocating for the Millican Valley area. I live out there. I live at a, a Stephen Roth's um, mobile home that was a ranch house. I'm almost all the way up to the forest. So I see these things and I would offer to the committee, whatever you do, any of these allegations that have been made, which I feel are false, but we're not going to get into an argumentative situation here. Be sure you vet those, look at them, do the research, because, um, for instance, Melican Valley Airport is not on this map. This is the Deschutes National Forest map that's uh, distributed. And uh, in the time I've been out there, I have yet to see an airplane, I see hang gliders, they land up on the BLM and they do land there right when you turn off the highway. But uh, I, I think the hang glider thing, if I'm a hang glider pilot and I don't wanna fly over the, the landfill because of the Moses' tower pillar of fire that led the Israelites out of Egypt, um, I'm gonna avoid that, okay? So anyhow. Uh, Millican Valley, and I'm speaking directly of the Roth property. There's two parcels. I sold them that property years ago. We had it listed when I showed it to Patty and the previous landfill gentleman. They were both rather excited, but we ran into sage grouse. I've seen one sage grouse out there. I've, I've been horseback with the Roths. I, like I say, I drive that road twice a day and, uh, the reason they cut down those junipers was to get rid of the observation towers for the owls and the ravens and the uh, hawks that prey on the sage grouse. There's been some submission about, uh, we don't want ravens at the landfill. Well, I would ask you, if I'm a raven, would I rather try and go find a, a chick or an egg, or am I gonna camp on the landfill and eat all this wonderful garbage that the people have been throw out? Uh, it's kind of like the black bears in Yellowstone. The wildlife, I, <laughs> I'm sorry, but I, I just don't see it. I haven't seen a deer out there for uh, ever since way last summer, certainly no elk. Um, one little band of antelope down towards Millican um, but I don't think we're going to impact that. I would say that 
There are strategies in place to mitigate the sage grass loss of habitat. There's a, there's a forest service permit on Pine Mountain, 17,000 acres. There's a BLM grazing permit that's right contiguous and part of the Roth property. Uh, both of those could be retired as a quid pro quo for the, the sage grouse. So that might be a, something to think about. There's already two wells there. Uh, my well is 925 feet deep. There's a well long for it. So whether or not uh, a landfill with good liners is going to impact that 925 feet, I doubt it. There's 30 million cubic yards of aggregate already. Uh, it's been assayed out there on the Roth property. Previous owner did that work. Um, so there's dirt. And I understand the landfill needs dirt every day. Uh, let's see. Both tax lots comprise 3,400 acres. You can put a landfill out there and then have room for five more probably uh what's next live there milepost 26 is where the millican store is it's not all that far from ben folks um as far as all of the the residences out there most of those are on 10 acre lots which do not comply with the efu zoning i i question how they were permitted and I've got a big question mark behind permit. Uh, I look at those every day. And while they're not totally offensive, they're certainly not this broad expanse of sagebrush step beauty that some people talk about. Uh, the land is not flat. The desert is not flat. People drive to Burns thing. Oh my God, I hate it. It's so flat. You get horseback out there or on a four-wheeler, and there is so much undulation and uh, feature to the land. I, I think you could put a landfill. I mean, the landfill at 27th and Rickard <laughs> is highly visible, and yet people drive by it. They don't think another thing about it. Finally, another reason perhaps for that site is the Bonneville high-tension power lines are immediately to the east. In fact, they cross some of Stevens property. If down the road, they decide that there's a, a potential for cogeneration from biofuels, um, you build another substation, you clip on the line, and now you're generating power. And you're not that far from Crook County. I call it the Les Schwab Speedway, the new road that comes in from uh, the highway and ends up out there on the west side of Prineville, um, which is fairly proximal to the Crook County landfill. Uh, perhaps Crook County would want to partner and, and or at least bring their stuff and be a moneymaker. I think that's about all I have today, folks. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pear. Here we have uh, one more that uh, Mike Manning. Good morning. My name is Mike Manning. I'm a resident and landowner in Milliken. I'd like to start by dispelling a rumor that all the properties out there are illegal properties. The majority of the properties out there were split from the Paul Irv subdivide in 1977 and are, in fact, legal lots. Um, they all are lots of record. Many, including myself, are grandfathered in over the EFU from the 1985 judgment and are allowed conditional use permits to build our homes. Uh, my parents bought this property for me when I was two years old. Uh, they bought it for my future, for my family. My proposed build site, which I am allowed a conditional use permit, I'm grandfathered in, I'm allowed to build out there. The Roth property site is 800 feet from the front door of my proposed building site. 800 feet from the door that my children have to walk out of to go to school. You know, um, 
there are some properties out there that were split down even further after 1977. And of course, yes, those will not be legal properties. The smaller ones will not, but they are still make up a larger legal lot out there. So we're not talking about a community of homeless people who have just found land and decided to go out there. You know, um, as Mr. Rice said, they've been flying out there since the 80s. There was a community out there in the 70s that went out there to, to take advantage of all the dirt bike trails to ride out there. You know, this is that this in the last 50 years, this has been a, a very recreational area from all kinds of things, riding horses, dirt bikes, four wheelers, quads, you know, Jeeps, um, from flying, paragliding, hang gliding, you know. This is the natural beauty of this place, is what makes Central Oregon great. Now, um, one of my concerns, and I know that we got the EFU, there's ways around that. I know the EFU does allow a landfill. I am having trouble finding, though, when after reading the wildlife crossover zonings, is there a contingency clause on their fencing requirements? According to the wildlife zoning, fences have to be 15 inches off the ground and no more than 36 inches high for wildlife to travel under, tra travel over. Uh, the large area that they did cut down the junipers, there, there was actually a news article about that. Um, it was for sage grouse habitat. Sage grouse don't nest near high trees. Their predators sit in there, they're ground nesters. So in order to establish more nesting area is according to this news article that I saw, the reason they cut down those junipers out there. Um, another thing, the natural history, the archeological, treasures that are out there. I am native descent. My fiance is native descent. You know, these were hunting grounds for our people for thousands of years. We walk out there, just looking, for, you can walk anywhere. You look down at the ground, you're gonna find chunks of napped obsidian over a thousands of years spans. I, for one, just walking out there looking for stuff, enjoying where my people used to hunt I have found arrowheads from the last 200 years. I have found two native burial sites between the Spencer Well, the Ford Road site and the Roth property site. There are two native burial sites out there. And I've also come across an Eden Point spearhead. Now, if you're not familiar with an Eden Point, an Eden Point is 8,000 years old. So there is physical evidence up to 8,000 years of native peoples hunting this land. The historical value, if we're gonna be digging a hole out there, it should be an archeological dig. You know, it's, it's, it's more than just the history out there so much. I mean, you go back to, to George Milliken's original ranch, you know, the Hart brand, one of the last wild horse ranches in Oregon. You know, that the history is, there's so much to be lost. Uh, a point that I want to make, I know that at Milliken, a lot of the opposition that you're getting is between two sites, the one on Ford Road and Spencer and the one on Pine Mountain Road. Um, and I know Mr. Payer was saying that, you know, talking about the proximity to the power lines. Well, there is a third site out there that is pretty much right underneath those power lines. So if we're going to talk about future planning and, and adding power out there, it just makes more sense to be out in that area anyway. But not only that, to that site to the east, like Mr. Payer said, the desert's not flat. The Spencer Wells site, the Pine Mountain site, you can see for miles and miles around, no matter where you're at out there. The site to the, to the east by the power lines, you can't see it from anywhere in the valley. You know, that site would affect the flyers because, you know, you're 10,000 feet in the air, you're going to see everything. Um, 
I guess that's really all the comments that I wanted to make was, you know, that uh, there are a lot of legal properties out there. There are a lot of properties that are out there that are still held by the original families that bought them, which means that every one of those properties are also allowed a conditional use permit. Their families are also allowed to come out and build the build on the properties that their families had bought for them, the investment properties that they had bought for the future. You know, I understand the need for, for a new landfill. I mean, it has to be done. You know, we all need it. You know, it's this kind of a slap in the face to tell you the truth, that to be told that, okay, we're thinking about setting a landfill out here in your backyard, but you can't use it. You still got to load up all of your trash, drive it 30 miles into bed so that you guys can drive it 30 miles back to our backyard and throw it in the dirt. You know, and let's talk about logistically. I drive a dump truck. Grades are no fun. Grades are expensive. You lose all your speed. You burn all kinds of fuel trying to get up these hills. Horse Ridge is a massive grade. You know, we're, gonna, we're talking about adding a lot of traffic. That's going to cause congestion out there because a dump truck can't make it up that hill at more than 40 miles an hour on a good day. Um, there are other sites. You know, I look at the Badlands site and I realized one of my favorite hiking spots is the Dry River Canyon there. And I don't particularly want a landfill right there, but you look at the Badlands, there's a gravel pit there. And driving by, even walking the trails there, you wouldn't even know because it's so far back. It's off the road. You know, is it a possibility to get something going on with uh, Hooker Creek to where instead of having to dig a new pit, we could maybe work something with them and start to use their pit as they're moving and, and mining, take advantage of the pit, the hole that's already there might save a lot of money. Something to think about. Um my biggest concern would just be some of the historical values out there. You know, there's thousands and thousands of years of history from Native people in that ground, specifically between those two sites. Um, I guess that's really all I got to say is, uh, you know, it's, it's beautiful out there. A lot of people have made great points. The aqueduct, the recreational, you know, I could go on and on and on, but it would just be repetitive because you've heard it all. Um, but uh, I guess that's really all I have to say. Thank you for your time. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Manning. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay, so uh, uh, any more last minute public comments out there? Okay, we're gonna move forward with the, with the meeting. Sue, if you can scroll to the next slide here. Um, Sue, any raised hands? I did not ask about anyone online. Okay. Okay. Sorry, you can present this part. No. Okay. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, our the roadmap for getting to 2029. Um, and uh, just kind of a little bit of a rehash here, 2017 to 2019, the salt waste management plan was uh, was adopted. Um, a number of people made comments here. So there, there, there was a lot of background research that, that went into that. And I suggest if you have not looked at the salt waste management plan, um, if, you, if you're interested, uh, take a look at, at the details that are in there. Uh, currently, we're, uh, we're underway with screening, evaluating potential locations for the new facility. The, the, the goal is to get to a single preferred site in the spring of 2024. Um, our, our plan is at the March meeting, hopefully get ourselves narrowed down to three to five sites for, for further evaluation. Uh, 2024 to 2027 is as property acquisition if we have to acquire a, a privately or publicly held land. And then <clears throat> I've been assuming 2027 forward, we would have the keys to a site and uh, begin the, the site development process for being ready to open when not landfill reaches capacity. And, 2029. Oh, oh, Sue is doing. Oh, it. Sue. Is oh, doing you it. got it. Yeah. Okay. okay. 
All right, so a little bit of an update. I'm gonna take this here. A little bit of update on where we are with the uh, with the process. So those of you that have been following, uh, uh, last week we did meet the county with the County Board of Commissioners after uh, meeting with the Salt Waste Advisory Committee and uh, did adopt a policy that uh, uh, we, will, we recognize the FAA's recommendation for a, a, a five mile radius uh, for siting a landfill as a, as a, a condition for that, that siting. So the, the three sites, uh, the one um, out Rick and Road, the CUID property up Bear Creek, and then a facility up in, in Redmond are, have been dropped off the list as of last Wednesday. Um, the, the one site uh, uh, identifies acquisition potential to be determined. Um, our property management people have reached out to the property owners and they haven't said no, but they also haven't said yes. They're, they, they want a little bit more information from us. Um, we had two sites that were dropped off. Owners uh, requested removal from consideration. And uh, um, the, the GI ranch, the sites out furthest east out there, they have expressed an interest in, in not participating with us as well. So um, those sites will likely be dropped off. And uh, um, we have we have been talking with, with Department of State Lands, the, the two properties on DSL land out there. They do have some existing uh, um, grazing leases out there. So that poses a potential complication for us. So those sites are, are looking like they may fall off as well. Yeah. Yes. I'm not controlling the computer. I, I don't believe we have an active cursor for that. Not a cursor. Yeah. 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 But not everybody, I'm trying to refresh my own memory. But I'm, I'm sure. Sure. If you have specific questions on a specific site, Robin. Um, well, first of all, on the five mile thing, I'm looking at what I didn't hear, but would any part of the, every, no part of the site would have to be within five miles of the business, or could you just you know, put the light on that edge? Well, if if it uh, if the uh, a developable area within a parcel is outside the five mile radius, I believe that would would warrant consideration. All, all three of those sites, what's left over once you take that five mile cut out of it, is just not not functional for for constructing a, a two hundred fifty acre facility. The GI Ranch ones, are the yeah, the furthest east. east. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, they, they, we've been having trouble hearing back from the property owners. We started reaching out to them in December, and uh, um, I ended up having to go to the GI Ranch's office to talk with them. They were, they responded back to me, so I, I, th I, I suspect they're going to pass on on this. And I think one of them is also a potential uh, BLM wilderness surrounded by so it creates a problem. We have not heard that. Um, we did meet with uh, um, uh, Fish and Wildlife and Fish and Game recently. And uh, one of the two GI sites is surrounded by uh, um, uh, uh, Cougar Cougar Well Wilderness Study Area. Yeah, so Wilderness Study Area. Study area. That that poses some potential problems for us as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then, but those other two blue sites, the next two over, are still in. The... No, those are likely going to drop off. We yeah, those are the Department of State Lands properties. There, there's existing uh, grazing rights on those that that may be a challenge for us. And then the two that are kind of reddish. In the Millican area, those are two that were dropped off privately held that we're not interested in participating. One of those is to the north of Highway Twenty, right? Correct. Yeah, just be, just uh, east of Milligan on the north Milligan on the north side of the highway. So the Roth property is still there, but the one between the Ford, Spencer Ford. Wells and Ford. That's yeah, the, the Ford Road. Spencer yeah, Ford. Oh. That, that was a collection of I think four or five property owners, and one property owner passed, and so that kind of right now you're just down, we're down to three sites. So Golden Basin, the one that's just slightly south and east of Badlands, the Moon Pit, right? Correct. And the, yeah. The Roth property. Yeah. But if you look at the agenda, we do have some potential additional sites okay, that, that we'll just, discuss briefly. I was just trying to visualize what you'd said earlier. Yeah. And you know, the question the commissioners asked me this question at the meeting last Wednesday. I mean, this is this is the process here. Um, you know, it's it's just, just not looking at uh at uh, um, the engineering wildlife considerations, part of this process is dealing with the property owner. So um, the fact that we're whittling down through this process, this is what the focus screening process is, is intended to do here. And the following slides will provide uh, a little more detail on each site. Would you mind passing it down? You don't have this presentation, that way we can view it. I, we did not get printed up, I'm sorry. Not yet. Oh, the keyboard. Oh. We can do it after the meeting. Like if it's posted on our website like the day before or something. Yeah. Yeah. We can work. Yeah. 
Oh, just send it out as pre-work. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, a little more information on the Moon Pit site. Uh, we have the scoring there is 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 not an update necessarily. This is still from from broad site screening. We'll reveal the the results of focus screening later. But uh, I think what's more important than that, I mean, that shows kind of the relative relationship between those different criteria and in general how the site appears to for, perform against those. But what we'd like to highlight here is, you know, just this larger blow up of the map to give a sense of, you know, it's this it's proximity to other features and um, and also some considerations um, based on things that we've found out um, through the screening process. And so uh, the Moon Pit site is owned by Hooker Creek. It's an existing surface mine site. Um, there are on-site industrial wells uh, already in place. Um, it, there's a paved road from Highway 20 to the site, which also provides access to the Badlands um, trailhead there. Um, there's no residences within one mile. Um, the nearest one is there to the west near that county parcel shown in yellow. Um, and uh, there's the potential for landfill cells to be excav excavated by gravel mining operations. So there's a uh, potential for symbiosis there in those operations. Um, they dig it down, uh, landfill operations fill it up, uh, simply put. Um, and with this site, environmental and cultural resources and related impacts have already been studied and are currently being monitored in relation to the, the current gravel operations. Um, it is adjacent to the Bad Badlands Wilderness Area and Trailhead, which is to the west and the northwest. Um, it was also established prior to designation of the Badlands as a wilderness area. Um, and it is approximately 15 to 20 miles from the way centroid, depending on the haul route that's taken, whether it's Rickard or 27 and then Highway 20. A little longer, but less um, impacts through uh, the road uh, corridor. Excuse me. You want us, there's a couple other things that come to might come to mind for each of these sites. Should we say them now? Or sure. we... yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That'd be great. This is This is the committee meeting, yeah. Yeah. So obviously the trade-off here would be with recreation and wilderness. Um, I don't know if the dry, if you looked into whether the dry creek trailhead, the conflicts, if it could be relocated. And also um, wilderness, you know, what the um, the law would say with something being immediately adjacent to a wilderness. Um, and, you know, what would have come into play there also would be the trails in the wilderness as well as noise and um, lighting. Yeah. Well, one thing um, I think that we can mm. an answer clearly is that lighting is not a part of the site design. There's no need to light up the landfill at night. Um, so I think um, there's that. Um, also, um, yeah, it's an existing industrial use um, where rock hammering is going on currently. Um, filling would be, um, you know, and landfill uses operations would be similar, if not less impactful than what's currently occurring. And so, um, yeah, just something that will be taken into account. And in our discussions with wildlife agencies, um, they shared with us how their tools account for areas that are already disturb disturbed in comparing existing conditions to proposed conditions. And given that the site's already disturbed, there's less um, habitat currently existing that would then be impacted, at least on site. Um, you haven't talked to BLM, it sounds like. About, about this site? No, we have not. They would be the key agency there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, any other thoughts on this site? Yeah, I just want to reiterate the, the lighting question. That has, <clears throat> excuse me, come up repeatedly. So um, there, there is no um, area lighting at not landfill, and I would not anticipate doing anything like that at any other facility. <clears throat> it would be limited to you know security and safety lighting around doors into buildings and things like that. And that, of course, would all be down, downlit. So, um, Lighting has has, a, has been a question that's come up quite a bit, and uh, it's it's something that is is not as as big an issue as people may may think. I've been I think I made a comment at one of the meetings. I've been out at not landfill in the middle of the night. It's scary dark out there. It's yeah, pretty spooky. Yeah. I guess the other thing that jumps out here would be garbage quality <laughs> to the wilderness. You know, affecting the wilderness quality and experience. And I don't know if there's a way to mitigate that. 
Um, you know, I, 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 one side I can comment on if you're if you're going down Interstate Five uh, through Central California, there's a Crow's Landing landfill, and they have a fairly substantial um, uh, fencing system. The, the the wind primarily blows out of the west, <clears throat> directly across Interstate Five, and uh, you don't see a lot of litter there. But the, the the one comment somebody brought up about fencing fencing requirements for wildlife uh, movement that's that's something that would have to be evaluated as well. But uh, um, uh, the, the only true mitigation you can do for, for litter is, is uh, fencing as well as how you op operate your landfill. And keep in mind, on any given day, not landfills, active areas about 10,000 square feet. You know, it's, it's not 250 acres of landfill operations. It's a, it's a very small area at a time, and our, our working face is typically limited to about 10,000 square feet. On windy days, we get aggressive with apply, applying cover over the top of the active area. On, on a typical day, you wouldn't do that cover till towards the end of the day, but... Uh, you know, we, we, not landfills, it's a place to run a landfill. We got neighbors right over the fence from us. So uh, litter is definitely a, something that can be a challenge at times. I'm not going to say we're going to successfully mitigate 100% of the time, but there are things you can do to, to keep that, to minimize that. And you're going to look at the Dry Creek Trailhead to see if, if there, how you would deal with the access. You're to talking the, about the one, as soon as you get off Highway 20 off to the right there? Yeah, it seems yeah, like Dry Canyon. You, dry Canyon, I mean. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure how how that would be impacted you know yeah. I, obviously something we'll, we'll take a look at it seems like you go through that i'm trying to remember you go through that site no you don't know you, no, you turn know. off still turn off the road and go down right. yeah yeah oh, okay yeah, so, so it wouldn't it wouldn't impact access to that site okay yeah. either direction but dry river canyon or blm so you're saying you have had some quick conversations with odf and ob about mm -hmm. we did we did meet you haven't them. spoken to blm yet about B BLM is very hard to get a hold of. Um, well, I, I yeah, can to touch it, on BLM. We need to figure that out because yeah. in terms of this location being one of the primary sites that's left, we yeah, figure out yeah. pretty quickly yeah. here if there are some yeah, major issues. I'm going to touch on BLM a little bit later in the, 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 the mm -hmm. presentation. Um, given that they're the ones who manage the wilderness area, right? right. That's Highway 20 in the very southeast <clears throat> corner, lower left corner. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Yep. Okay, we've got about seven more to roll through. Thank, thank you all for the input and discussions. Um, so next one is the uh, Golden Basin site. Um, acquisition potential. Um, I think there is potential based on, on Chad's is. comments. Yeah. Um, the owner's um, willing to converse and discuss further. Um, this site has a bowl-like topography that's favorable for landfill. It's between the second and third ridges of Horse Ridge. Um, there's kind of a series of ridges, the large one, and then there's two um, smaller ones to the southwest. And this is between those two and has uh, very favorable topography in that sense uh, for a bowl-type um, fill. Um, and it's, it's, there's no residences within one mile. It's very remote and well hidden from most nearby viewpoints. Um, it, it's surrounded by BLM land. Um, there is mapping of golden eagle habitat nearby uh, that would need to be studied further and mitigated. Um, there's no wells or water rights on site, um, no nearby power infrastructure. Um, and also it, being remote, it would require a six, about a six mile access road to be constructed. Um, our archeological, um, uh, Subconsultant uh, stated that there's likely to, to be archaeological resources uh, within this area, um, and it's within the low density sage grouse habitat area, and it's approximately 16 to 20 miles from the way centroid. So again, these are just general considerations, not highlighting any as you know pros or cons or whatnot, but just these are the well, I think findings. There's one more you may not be aware of, but um, immediately adjacent to it is the Horse Ridge Resource. Uh, research natural area and the idea of that is to have a pure you know pristine area so it, if the landfill brings in weeds if the garbage blows in there that would be a direct impact and also um i think you know the predators coming into the I mean the sage grass predators coming into this site would would impact sage grass habitat even this the site is probably historic sage grass habitat but it would still impact anything near it. Yeah, I believe that study area is nearby to the northeast, but it's not immediately adjacent to the site. Oh, it's not. Pretty close. 
Yeah. I mean, I'm looking at a map. It's right there. It's map. <laughs> Google Maps. Uh, the other thing I would say is that um, this is a growing mountain biking area. I mean, just so you know, there's a lot of growing recreationists out there. Um, there's trails that go right basically through this site. I mean, I suppose they're probably not on the private property. That's how they managed to get the trails going here, but um, um, mm -hmm. it's actively used by mountain bikers. And I don't mean just Horse Ridge itself. I mean this particular yeah. place, right? The, this basin, yeah. Yep. Um, okay, so the Roth sites, there are... Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> what is it? Yeah. Sure. Is it the SWAC member, Sue? Oh, Fish and Wildlife. Yeah. Yeah. Is she going to speak online? <clears throat> Hi, this is Emily with Fish and Wildlife Service. I was just going to say I can put you guys in contact with the appropriate BLM staff for this. I know they've probably been hard to get a hold of simply because they're at a pretty reduced capacity. And also, if they're involved in any decisions, they don't like to become involved because that would then make them look pre decisional on stuff. And if they have to go through NEPA, that is not good. So um, I will gladly send an email um, to the folks with the SWAC and CC some BLM folks as well. Um, do, you, do you know the names of the people, Emily? Just off I do. I was going to put their emails in chat, but I thought they might not lock me for that. So you'd want to get a hold of Jimmy Eisner. That's a new name. That's a new name. I have not had that one. Yeah, they've been playing musical chairs with, um, you know, just folks moving around and detailing in different positions. So Jimmy Eisner, James Eisner, and then Lisa Clark. I've spoken with Lisa. And then Ferris Couture, who is their environmental slash NEPA coordinator. Yeah, he, ha he has been in attendance at a number of these meetings as well. So mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Okay, Ferris thank you, Emily. Is a, Ferris is a she, FYI. Um, oh. But yeah, and so that those are two reasons why they might be hard to get a hold of currently. But you know, if you reach out to them, I let them know that hey, the they'd like to probably talk with you guys. Yep, we'll follow up with them shortly. Thanks. Um, okay, so the rock site. Are we okay to proceed? Um, so. Currently, there are two Roth sites under consideration. Um, I think one of those was discussed today. What are um, the numbers on these sites again? The, uh, the ID is 2015-00-301. That's the West tax lot, the one that's been seen to date and studied. We've begun studying the Eastern site, which has been um, been discussed more recently. Um, and that's 2015-00-301. That's the tax lot to the East. And, and we've heard the concerns uh, about proximity to residences and some of the recreational activities and Pine Mountain Road and visibility from the highway and found some unique benefits to this site relative to the other one. Uh, it's approximately a mile, the footprint is a mile from uh, the Pine Mountain Access Road um, and looks like about the same distance from the highway. And you may be able to vaguely see some of the contours there. Um, there it's well hidden by the the surrounding topography from the highway. Couldn't even see it uh, from the highway. Uh, in most locations, you'd have to really look for look for it at the right angle. Um, and so there's that relative benefit there. Um, and uh, both parcel owners are willing to sell and they're each 1700 acres or more. Um, it, it, they are within the Millican Valley and Plateau um, and within low density sage grass habitat area. Um, there are rec a variety of recreational uses in the vicinity, the broad vicinity, um, and the nearest residence in this case is 0 0.7 miles distant approximately um, from either of those disposal sites. Um, and this, the east side's further from Pine Mountain Access Road, better screened from view by topography, and both sites are approximately 23 to 27 miles from the waste centroid. 
you may see that well buffer there on the east side. Um, we checked into that. Uh, well log well logs are um, sometimes are almost always sketchy in their mapping, um, often to just the, the quarter quarter or the section level. And so uh, we look further into this one and confirm that it there in fact is no well <laughs> on the east border there. So um, there's not that uh, there's no concern about uh, groundwater uh, or well impacts for that one in particular um, being near the site. What what is the closest well again for each of those? Oh, you don't know that. Um, I don't have it noted offhand. Um, but if the ones to the east are mapped accurately, it appears to be a half mile or so from the east site. And it looks like approximately the same for the west site in relation to the other uh, two. So um, potentially an improvement uh, upon the west site, but um, yeah, has some unique advantages there that we'll be studying further um, with that as a distinct site um, separate from the Roth West. That property and I guess the same uh, elaboration on the sage grouse it this site even if the site itself doesn't have sage grouse at the moment it was historic and also it would bring in predators that would impact other sage grouse areas nearby Ryan you're saying that which of the two sites are you saying is better screened from the one to the east the east um Um, due to some topography, there's an intermediate high point at the north end of that site uh, that kind of tucks it in, so to speak. And then there's another um, high point between this site and uh, the highway that screens it from view. Uh, have you been up there physically? Yes. Because I know exactly what you're referring to. And can see that whole hillside <laughs> until you go up and over the highway in toward brother uh plane and road for miles. So I don't know of any major geological feature that would block a 250 acre dump site. And I think that's absurd saying that that's one of the features for that property because I look at that pretty day to day. Any other further thoughts on this site? This is the DSL site uh, 21 Um As mentioned, acquisition potential is challenging for this one due to ownership by the Division of State Lands. The property is encumbered by existing grazing land leases uh, that are tough to break. Um, Good size property at 625 acres. Um, however, an access easement would be required for truck access from Highway 20. No residences within 1.7 miles, which is beneficial. No known existing wells or water rights on site, uh, which, which could be a challenge to establish. And there's a power line along Highway 20 that could be accessible um, for uses on site. And this is approximately 52 to 56 miles from the way centroid. Um, as Chad had noted, this one's likely to, to fall off due to the acquisition challenges, but just thought we'd give an overview here. Because of the grazing leases. Yes. DSL also identifies parcels for specific uses, whether there's actually an existing grazing lease on it. Um, so there, were, there was a number of challenges that came up in my conversations with them. We're also getting to considerable distance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as noted, 52 to 56 mm -hmm. miles, yeah. How does this fit into the sage grouse story? Any of that, for, as you go further east, yeah, I understand. But in terms of the low, low, yeah, I don't know if that's low or or uh, um, general. Yeah, it's outside core, as you can vaguely see from the key map there. Um, it, yeah, it, it might even be outside. I remember seeing that of these two, one of them was outside sage grouse habitat entirely in the mapping. Yeah. So um, the next side is the, the DSL parcel to the north of the highway. Um, similar challenges with acquisition. Uh, property areas uh, quite large. 
2,117 acres, which offers multiple options for uh, an ideal configuration of a potential disposal site that can minimize impacts. It does have existing access via Highway 20 and a gravel road. Um, no residences within a mile. Um, potentially, I think it depends on how where it's located, um, but that could be true. It's large. This one's at a large scale. Um, but existing wells and residences are in the vicinity there, um, and it's adjacent to alfalfa farming. No known wells or water rights on site. Um, and yeah, power infrastructure is, is available along Highway 20, also 52 to 56 miles from the waste center. Is this one like, it looks very close to the road. How visible would it be? I think fairly visible, as I recall, that's fairly flat terrain out there. Yeah. Thank you. Um, next up is uh, GI Ranch East site. Um, owners are not very interested in, in working uh, or with the county on this one. Um, they have an active uh, ranching operation there. Um, and a uh, large parcel, about 2,600 acres, no residences observed within five miles. So it has that going for it. Flat topography um, in low density sage grouse area. And it is bordered by sage grouse core to the east, which is that darker shape. Um, there's evidence of ephemeral streams running through the site um, that some maps show. And you can see a, a vague outline of it. This area is actually at the headwaters of the south fork of the Crooked River. Um, and there's no existing wells or water rights on site. Uh, there is a 115 kilovolt uh, transmission line off site, approximately one and a half miles to the south. And it's 76 to 80 miles from the waste central. And this is north of the highway, right? What was that? North of the highway? Yes. And then the west site, also owned by the GI Ranch, um, surrounded by the Cougar Well Wilderness Study Area, uh, surrounded by BLM land. Um, an access easement would be required uh, from BLM for truck access from Glass Butte Road, which is the one shown to the east. Uh, flat topography, no residences within five miles. Um, Golden Eagle habitat is mapped adjacent to the west, and uh, there's no existing wells or water rights on site. And similarly, there's uh, that large transmission main offsite very nearby to the south, um, also 75 to 79 miles from the waste centroid. Yeah, I, I'm surprised this is still on the list, just given that it's surrounded by a wilderness study area. It doesn't really make much sense to me. It's it's likely dropping off. Yeah. 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 So next up, Chad will give an overview of the additional BLM areas of interest. And these are not specific sites, but they're regions uh, where uh, the county's interested in talking further with BLM. Um, and I believe Phil Chang is leading that effort. Um, and so Chad, would you like to yeah. elaborate further on that? So Commissioner Chang did meet with uh, uh, Senator Wyden and a couple other of our elected representatives in DC, Washington, DC in the past week or two uh, to discuss um, our, our challenges trying to work with the Bureau of Land Management on siting. Um, just a little quick update for, for some of the, the, the newer members that are sitting in on the committee here. So uh, a number of years ago, my predecessor and the prior county administrator did meet with BLM to discuss specifically about siting a landfill on BLM property. They walked out of the meeting with the, the decision that we would not pursue BLM land. Uh, the, the logistics and timing for it are a challenge. Mr. Chang asked me to revisit it with BLM. And again, the struggles of getting in contact with BLM people Finally heard that uh, six to 10 years, likely 10 years or or more to get a, a landfill site. So it does not work well with our site life or not landfill. Mr. Chang did meet with uh, representatives in Washington, D.C. And uh, Tim Burnell and I will be meeting with Commissioner Chang after the meeting today to get a little bit better update from him on that, that meeting. But uh, Mr. Chang did ask that we identify a couple locations for him to discuss with uh, our elected representatives in Washington, D.C. So the the uh, the 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 um the red rings on on that map are the uh, five mile exclusion area that the commissioners um approved that we abide by uh, last week 
that kind of got us to focus on these uh, these two uh, uh, areas just outside the intersection of the two lobes. The, the one on the, the the west side is is adjacent to Highway 97. There is are some smaller county parcels out there, but they're primarily in the five mile exclusion area. Um, BLM does have a zone three, which is identified for disposal parcel out there, not well configured, not quite shape right for us. Uh, to the east of that is, is BLM zone one, which has not been studied for disposal or acquisition, but uh, um, that would be advantageous if we could get hold of that. So again, Tim and I are gonna be meeting with Commissioner Chang after this meeting to discuss what he's learned in Washington, DC. Need to get some some specific information direction on on how to proceed. What on ninety seven? Uh, does the tracks create a problem? We will have to cross the railroad tracks, or we have to go through a neighborhood, and it's the I would rather not do the latter of the two. So it's, we could so come off of Pleasant Ridge Highway, Ple Pleasant Ridge Road, I think it's called, um, at the at the Deschutes Junction interchange, and stay on the the west side of the railroad tracks and get a a, a great crossing uh, at the, at the north end of Pleasant Ridge where it. Uh, veers off to Highway 97, where it's been closed off. But that's not a, that's not something that's going to create a huge problem. It is possible to cross those tracks. Well, I, I've I've been told that getting a grade crossing is far less time consuming than getting a uh, overpass, <laughs> as well as cost wise. A overpass would be a multi million dollar venture, and certainly with the experience in the South County, we don't want to make those kind of mistakes. So, um, at least at this point, I'm thinking if if this does get some traction, probably a grade crossing is what we would pursue. If possible. Yes. Yeah, and that would be a private road. It would not be a public road. Again, it's the landfill is limited access. Uh, so, so, so this site's east of Highway 97. Yeah, you know where it is, Mike, is just south, you know, the, the, the solar farm on the east side of the highway, it's just south of that a little ways. Um, where Pleasant Ridge Road is blocked off at 97, it's it's just to the east of that. Um, I, I think from a visibility standpoint, it's it's actually, it would be pretty good. Um, we do need to have conversations with the airports again to make sure they're okay with us being adjacent to them. And we're not going to to go in that five mile zone there, but uh, hopefully they won't have any concerns being immediately adjacent yeah. to them. And uh, how many acres? Um, as much as we want. Uh, um, I, I think when I mapped out to Commissioner Chang, I think I put 250 acres on my my rough map that I provided to him. I think there's about 800 acres in that. Yeah, if we were to yeah, if we were to do the entire wedge there, yeah. That's the little one. And it's even bigger on the other one, right? The one further east. Well, uh, the, the one further east, no, because you butt up against uh, the county line out there as well. So I, I think on that one. So there's there's two. So we we done talking about the one on the 97 side. Any other questions on the highway? 90? That that side does have some promise. I mean, from a purely logistical standpoint of landfill operations, right in the middle between Bend and Redmond, route trucks could go directly to that site. We wouldn't be doing a transfer of waste from either Redmond or Bend to that facility. Um, but there's these, these, these challenges we'll have to deal with primarily getting BLM land. I don't, I don't think the railroad crossing is, is that big an issue. I, the recommendation was we was to start talking with uh, Burlington Northern relatively early in the process. Then a great crossing is, is a little bit easier to deal with than doing it in an overpass. Yeah, I vaguely remember some like 14 trains a day or something. I can't remember now what, what it was a few years ago. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But there, you know, there's a multitude of, of great crossings, you know, between Ben and Redmond. So um, hopefully they, they would be receptive to that. Um, so off to the east side of the lobes there, there are two, two private properties, 80 acres each. One of them is roughly halfway into the, the, the Bend Airport five mile restriction. But uh, one of the thought process Commissioner Chang had was if we were to acquire those properties and get full assurance from BLM, we'd be successful acquiring their land. We, we, we could accommodate a longer timeline. We could start operations on those private properties if we were to acquire those and go get through the BLM process to, to get the balance of the site. So between the two properties, there's roughly you know, 120 acres of private land that, that we could acquire. I've, I've got a draft letter sitting on my computer home to send to those two property owners. One lives here in Bend, the other one is out in Louisiana. So it'd be a combination of acquiring some private land and then 200, 250 acres of BLM land out to uh, um, uh, uh, Powell Butte Highway. So about Powell Butte Highway would be the access to that, that site. We could, could we could dip over into Crook County, couldn't we, if we needed to, to make a good site? The problem is you you start getting close to Brasada Ranch, I think is, oh. is on the other side of the county line there. So <clears throat> as currently configured, we're roughly a mile from the closest mm -hmm. properties on, on a Crook County side of the line there. 
and there's no neither of these sites have major wells or residences to deal with um well the the there's there's no wells i believe on the 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 Powell Butte highway site <clears throat> excuse me there's a number of wells on the um highway 97 site if you driving up between the road tracks and the highway there are some agriculture operations there and the, the the sheriff's posse has a piece of property out there that they have a well on as well there are some residences on the east side of the county line in crook county yeah they may have wells on them. yeah but i i'd scale it roughly a, a mile i think from from, from those okay. yeah and is commissioner this, chang oh good sorry this to the east or west of Powell butte it would be on the east side of Powell butte highway uh, the the um, if if the BLM can fast track something with us, we could certainly go on the west side. Um, the the only connection we're holding on to the east side is the fact that there's two private parcels out there we might be able to acquire just to help get us an acre. Um, so Powell Butte Highway is not as convenient as Highway 97. No, you know I I, I was looking at that Ram. You went possibly in theory route trucks from both Red and Redmond and Ben could still access that site, but they the Redmond site in particular they'd have to go out Highway 126 and catch Powell Butte Highway from the north. And again here in Ben they would go out 20 about Powell Butte Highway to the side. I, I didn't scale what the mileage was off of it, but it's it's it may or may not be unreasonable. I, I don't know. I haven't looked at what those distances are yet. Um, but certainly the 97 site has has a lot of pluses strictly from that that logistical standpoint. Uh, the final site is down off of Highway 20 on the old part of uh, the Highway 20 that goes off to the east past uh, um, the old uh, Knife River and uh, uh, Robinson mining operations. Commissioner Chang asked us to find the site off of Highway 20, so um, we, we selected that. It's uh, um, essentially where Ford Road peels off of, I think, is that Ford Road? Tim, do you recall? No, it's Horse Ridge Road. Horse and, Ridge and Road. Stucky. Yeah, um, yes, yes, Stucky yes, Flats Road. There. So um, they um, anyway, we Commissioner Chang wanted something off Highway 20, so we stayed on the south side of Highway 20 to try to get as much distance from the uh, um, the, the Oregon Badlands as we could, because Oregon Badlands essentially right. orders Highway 20 all the way to almost to, to Rickard Road there. So how far is that from from Ben? What mile? Well, I would say uh, yeah, yeah. I was going to say about 10 miles. So not a, not not too terribly far out there. Might have some residences there. There's there are a couple of private residences between Highway 20 and the old and the old highway loop out there. Um, but again, we we just kind of arbitrarily plopped a piece of a, oh, okay. a, a box out there essentially. So it's it's not a fixed one. If anyone this this one is the, is the most loosely located. If uh, if the BLM is interested in playing ball with us on this, we could certainly move a little bit further. Um, east. Um, that, that's all in, in sage grouse, um, low density, I believe. Yeah. That's before you get up Horse Ridge and all that. Yeah, I don't know if you're familiar, Rob, when you're heading out Highway 20, the, there's a stretch of the old highway that peels off 20 and then comes back in yeah. right at the base of Milliken Grade there. They call it so Horse Ridge Frontage Road. Yeah. <laughs> happy to save access to Golden Valley. It, it would, if we were to develop the Stuky Flats Road, it would, we would take advantage of that existing gravel road to, to develop into something more substantial. Further west, okay. Yeah, for, further southwest, yeah. yeah. So again, we're um, meeting with Commissioner Chang. Commissioner Chang did mention at the board meeting, I'm kind of treated by this, that, that the BLM has some ability or authority to fast track up to 600 acres a year of BLM land to public agency. So I'm not sure what all that means. Um, hopefully Commissioner Chang has a little more detail for us when we meet with him today. <laughs> Well, obviously, you know, the, the BLM is interested in protecting, you know, enhancing sage grass habitat. So the real incentive for them is to, if this will result in an overall big picture with support from ODFW, if that happens, sure. then, then, you know, they could probably find a way politically to do it. Yeah. And Commissioner Chang seems to think there is some county parcels that BLM would be very interested in, in, in trading with. So, you know, the, the options are, you know, uh, acquisition, uh, a land swap. Mm -hmm. uh, you know anything about residences in this property you're just talking about the 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 one off highway 20 there there's a there's a couple hundred acre parcel between horse ridge and 20 mm -hmm. um that is residential that's a bit to the north and the east of where this potentially would be mm -hmm. there are also residences um further to the west i think it's a buffalo ranch 
uh, and others. Well, that's, that's at Dodge Road. Yeah. Near Dodge Road. Yeah. And so given the flexibility or the large area here, the, the attempt, the goal would be to minimize or maximize separation from residences in both directions, yeah. as well as the Badlands. I guess on the surface, I see fewer conflicts with those three than the ones we were considering previously. Certainly, if, if, if Commissioner Chang is able to expend some uh, political capital on this, um, which he is willing to do, we wanted to try to you know, yeah. find some optimal sites. And again, the airport thing kind of got us to focus on the, right. the, the areas outside the <laughs> two lobes there, and there, there's some def definite potential there. I think one thing that's been coming up for me is just this distance of nearby residences. And I know that the, you know, the basic fatal flaw thing is the quarter mile, which is based on, I believe, some combination it's, it's of shoots county codes. Yeah, it's, county code, yeah. right? So, um, but that distance seems way too short to me. I mean, I, I think, and I did spend some time looking at the research that we was referred to at the previous general meeting, not the one we did on the FAA. Um, um, <clears throat> and I mean, I think we've got it. I think the committee needs to wrestle with what are we going to recommend to the commissioners mm -hmm. in terms of, um, you know, if we think that quarter mile is actually even valid, frankly. Um, it seems to me it needs to be at least a mile, just in terms of um, as a kind of a minimum criteria. And, and largely that's about the human health um, stuff that comes up in some of the research. And I know the research isn't perfect. And, you know, I, uh, but, it seems to me that that's pretty important. <clears throat> one of the things taken into consideration yeah. in a way that we haven't really done so far. I don't think that I get why we use that as a fatal flaw, but I think we need to push that boundary mm -hmm. farther. Yeah, that's something we can certainly bring to the commissioners to ask them to get some guidance or, or agreement, similar to how we handled the FAA. Well, and I, I mean, my my feeling is that the committee should make a recommendation at some point. So I don't know. I mean, if all of you have seen the actual study yet, I mean, um, it's not. I'd like to see that. Too complicated to read. Um, it's not all about landfills. It's about other stuff as well. But um, Which side are you talking about? The one, one of the doctors who spoke at that oh, hearing. Okay. In, in I think January. that's the meta study. Yeah, that yeah. was just published this year. Yeah, um, I guess I'd like to see that. Um, yeah, I think at the January meeting, I made a suggestion that <clears throat> we draw maps with concentric polygons, you know, for a quarter, half, three quarter, and one mile. Mm -hmm. And I know that might be a lot of work, maybe not with GIS, but but at least for the, these three sites and the ones we're still considering, which would be mainly the, I guess the rot sites, if you're gonna, if those other ones are gonna drop. But yeah, there was a, your the email you had sent me. That's kind of a to do thing for for uh, parametrics to 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 get those those that information mm -hmm. together. The committee wanted to. Uh, um... Kind of like following on what Mike recommended, adjust that quarter mile. Like, would that be something that we could just kind of fold into our decision as is, or is it something that you would see us needing to go to the commissioners like sooner before we get through the whole analysis and have them make a decision now? Because I understand there's the there's the code and we're following that code, but do we have the option as the committee, like in a year from now, when we're kind of recommending that final site, to say like, well you know, to kind of go beyond just what the minimum code is for the recommendation, or do you want us to kind of figure that out sooner? You know, I, I, we could move forward with any recommendation, but uh, um, drawing the parallel with the FAA thing. So the, the the commissioners and the committee did agree to and approve this this uh, citing criteria that we're following, and that did specify the quarter mile. If if we if we want to formally do something, I, su I would suggest that we get a recommendation to the county commissioners. They're going to want to look at how that impacts the the, the siting process and the and the, the viability of that, that are remaining on the, that list. Um, that the, a mile could impact the the that potential high, highway ninety seven site for BLM. Mm -hmm. um, I mentioned uh, when Rob asked a question: if we were to stay on the east side of the railroad tracks at Deschutes Junction, you have to go through a neighborhood right there, and those may be within a mile of that that wedge between the, the two airport zones there. So that, that's something that that would that would be as a, that you as a committee would want to consider, but also the, the commissioners. So um, kind of a long answer. We could certainly recommend they recommend anything we want to the to the, the commissioners um, within reason. Um, but uh, um, if we if we wanted to do something more formal with that quarter mile thing, I think they have to go to the county commissioners for that because they did they did approve the criteria. 
you know how far um not is like what the buffer is from not landfill to any residences right now they're right across the bench from us so not landfill pre-existed the uh um that yeah. the establishment that code we have neighbors literally across the road within a quarter mile. Oh, well, within a quarter mile. We have a school across the street. Yeah. 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 Okay. yeah. I've always felt that it was not the optimal location. It's just the community grew up around us, and I would much rather be much further away from residences. Yeah. It's it's a challenge to, to run that site. I, I mean, I think, you know, we could proceed without changing the criteria, but when we make a recommendation to yeah. the commissioners, say, yeah. Yeah. we understand that and we think that this needs to be considered. and. So for that reason, these sites, we don't recommend them. Totally. Yeah, I, I think that makes sort of seems much more straightforward yeah. to me than yeah. having to go through some kind of, you know. So it's like we'll just evaluate it on a case by case basis as we. Yeah. 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 And, I, I, and to me, it seems like that's a really important part of what we need to ask going forward because we need very clear, real clarity about distance to residences mm -hmm. from now on on any site we look at. Yeah. It's got to be very clear. As soon as possible. Yeah. No, as we're moving forward, and to, to, as Ryan went down that list, of, you know, the sites that are, are proximal to your residences are falling off. Yes, yeah, right. You, know, you look at the Roth property and, and some of the people here that have commented on on being adjacent neighbors there, especially the the, the East property, the Roth property is is much further away from those residences. I think number of residences too, because we have the mm -hmm. we got the distance for these mm -hmm. final seven. But yeah. It's if it's if it's one versus like a whole you know kind of community that. Yeah, yeah, I think it'd be pretty straightforward to generate a, a, a count of the you know, number of instances within you know various radii around a, a given site there. That, that should be pretty and straightforward. And we do like that to the um, distance of, of um, houses to the border of the property or the potential location on the site of the landfill. I knew you could ask that. I think it's, a, I guess, a potential land. Um, landfill site i would think because the border may will go way out there yeah if you've got a 900 acre property in your yeah i mean we we don't know the exact location on that property i mean it would, it would have to guess yeah. determined a bit more by topography and, mm -hmm. and other issues on the site but we could give it a general sense mm -hmm. we know approximately where we are yeah and so then I, i'm assuming as we get into the the yeah. really specific yeah. evaluation we're part of that's going to be getting some sense of where the landfill is going to go. It's not going to wait until the final decision about just one property, right? Yeah. That's going to be part of the evaluation. Yes. So seem to the active part of the property where the landfill or the buffer it doesn't have to be to the edge of the buffer, but to the active. Is it worth seeking clarification from the county commissioner as to why you're limiting yourself to sites within the county? There could be potentially a lot of So <clears throat> when the salt waste management plan was being developed, um, we did reach out to Crook County, uh, uh, looked at at regional facilities, somebody made that suggestion. Crook County has over 100 years capacity at their landfill. Um, we had asked about, can we use their landfill? They said, no. Um, they said they might help us out for a brief period of time if we need to bridge a gap, but they have no interest in walking away from that asset they have. So. Crook County would not be an active participant in a regional facility here. Um, there, there was a, a, a lot of, uh, of media coverage about a landfill being cited, regional landfill being cited in Lake County. Um, they reached out to the, the county commissioners, and the commissioners elected to stay on the path we're on. We'll continue to watch what they were doing. Um, I think I mentioned at the past few meetings that has gone dark. There hasn't been any talk about that, but uh, uh, Fishing Game and Fish and Wildlife did mention to us that yeah, they're still out there somewhere. Um, so but that facility, they're they're nowhere near as far along as we are. We're not very far along, but they're 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 pretty far behind the eight ball as as far as getting getting to a, a point in 2029 to have a facility that we might be able to participate in. Um, so uh, the, the regional approaches were looked at, um, but uh, Cook County is sitting pretty pretty good with what they have as far as their their capacities. And not that hundred year capacities for what they project they would be. It doesn't include the shoots count. Correct. Yeah, that is strictly Crook County so managed in their own way. Capacity yeah. on that. Oh yeah. 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 They basically said thanks, but no thanks. They were not interested in in allowing us to take our waste there. They said like I said they they, they said they, they might help us out a little bit bridging a gap for a short period of time, maybe you know diverting Redmond waste there, but they were by no means interested in a long term arrangement with us to take our waste. But what about them selling some property 
to the Schutz County, for the Schutz County to develop a landfill. In other words, not using their landfill, but yeah. if you're to buy some property <laughs> from county, maybe near the border. Yeah, that that was not entertained. Um, Tim Shimke, my predecessor, was here. I don't know if there was ever any discussions about acquiring land outside the Schutz no, County. I was preferred that we be in the Schutz County, but there's nothing that says that we have to not be outside. But I think the county did be looking at the potential sites in the county. If there are no more, it's pretty, pretty really difficult, maybe expanding out there would be something they have to consider. Um, obviously, if you're going into another county, the land use, the permitting, it's a lot different than when you're trying to do that in your own county. That's more than yeah. And most likely there'd be a host fee from that 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 county to to take our waste. They would want to get a little bit of dollars out of us for that as well. Um I I just wanted to make a quick point as to uh, reference for the quarter mile at the mile. Mm -hmm. like, and so I know code says a quarter mile, but given that it's on public uh, records and all that, do any members are aware of potential health risks within certain distances to the landfill that it might be advisable? to ensure the landowners adjacent to anything, either sign a, a waiver you know, to the fact that they're aware of that or you know, possible lawsuits in the future because it's more and more evident um, our local government and overall agencies don't always have, you know? That, that's a policy decision well above this, this committee. That would require I mean, I know the legal can make a recommendation to change code besides just I could write into the commissioners and suggest that it change. <laughs> we, we have legal counsel here. What does it take to change the code? Okay. Good morning, everyone. Stephanie Marshall, assistant legal counsel here at the county. Um, <clears throat> so there is an application to change the code. And so it, it would have to be, it could be obviously committee uh, generated. Um, you know, they would work with the uh, CDD, the planning department, because the planning department processes applications for code amendments. There's a state process as well as a local process. Notification has to be made to um, the state uh, Department of Land Conservation and Development. Um, and then obviously would have to be uh, uh, heard by the planning commission, considered first by the planning commission, and then the planning commission would make a recommendation to the board of county commissioners. So um, theoretically, you know, is that something that could be proposed? Um, certainly, you know, um, the process would be somewhat time consuming. I mean, it wouldn't happen for, oh gosh, you know, at least six months, I would say at the very earliest and um, I'll just reiterate that I, I kind of like the um, the comment that I heard from a member on the committee of, well, you know, the code is written as the code is written. You know, I mean, it's it's the the minimum quarter mile. The committee as 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 it stands does not need to, um, you know, go right up to the edge of that quarter mile. They can they can uh, recommend uh, something to the board of county commissioners that is further than that minimum that's established. So again, I don't know if it's required to change the code, um, you know, and, and the process and the and the resources and, and time. So um, I hope that answers the question. Thanks, Stephanie. <clears throat> and my, uh, you know, talking about additional sites, uh, Chad, I appreciate your email on the 400 acres. A lot of people have brought it up with the public. Oh, the rose pit across the street. Yeah, as the reasons, what the problems that all the log logistical problems with that site. This wouldn't be up. You know, maybe we should put that in the record and also, um, you know, make sure there's not some way to thinking out of, outside the box of making that site work. Mm -hmm. And obviously, it wouldn't work with what we're thinking of right now, but is there, um, is there some other new, different approach that could make that site work somehow? Because it is so close. Yeah. So let me uh, let me restate. Uh, Robin had asked me some specific questions about the rose pit, which is the property for sale immediately south of not yeah. landfill. And there's a there's a <laughs> several substantial issues with that site. Um, so first off, there's a, a um, Bonneville power transmission line runs dead set through the middle of that that property. Um, relocating that is is I don't think I made the comment is could be just as challenging as siting a landfill. We're talking about moving that 
those that that alignment and it would impact private properties in there as well the, the bigger criteria and i kind of brought it up as a oh by the way last minute thing was similar that the same line in county code that specifies no landfill within a quarter mile of a of a private property residence is no landfill within a quarter mile of a public road so rickard and Arnold Market and I think it's Rimfire are on three sides of that property. So if you push the development of the land a quarter mile from three sides of that site, you have something substantially under 200 acres there. Add the, the well restrictions from the, there are agriculture operations and some private wells on, on properties around that site. There's just simply not enough room there to do anything effective with it. Yeah, that's- And it's not possible to take advantage of the bottom fill. I'm sorry? To take advantage of the power line to somehow aid with power generation. Well, we have a, I mean, our not landfill is actually ideally situated because so we have a substation right. behind us. That's what you need to have <clears throat> on to power distribution is a substation. So, I mean, there's a substation right there behind not landfill. The Bonneville power lines, this case, would not play a role in any kind of power generation or transmission process here. Um, it, it's, it, it's, it's unfortunate that that site has so many encumbrances on it, but it's, it just simply has too many challenges associated with it. And again, if you, when I, when I was putting that email together to you and I was reviewing that line on the code and I just completely glanced over the public road part of it there. So three sides of the site, quarter mile in, that takes a huge bite out of that property. We might want to document what you just said on it. Absolutely. I'll, I'll include, uh, um, the map that I, I provided to you on that as, as well. Yeah. I believe we captured that in the FAQs as well. Oh, we did. Okay, yeah, because it's it's come up a number of times, so that right. it's actually on the FAQs on the on the website for the project. And that code was written after the landfill went into. I mean, it's sort of yeah. I mean, not land. So the, the, it's not landfill. It's still subject to those rules because we have we have a landfill within a quarter mile of road now. It's been about so <laughs> right. That's hundred feet, feet road, right yeah. now. Yeah, yeah. but <laughs> so. Uh, you know, <laughs> this is this is when it comes to be a question of whether it's a new landfill or an expanded landfill, and um, and I think that we we addressed that at a prior meeting. I recall, um, you know, I mean, new absolutely can't be cited. You know, I mean, the the not landfill is is in existence was you know grandfathered all of that, and I I I mean I can't speak to what the committee has. Um, looked at as far as whether rose uh the rose pit could be an expansion of and and benefit but you know there comes a point also with grandfathering laws where um <clears throat> because the whole point of grandfathering is to you know allow a use to continue but not you know not just kind of go uh well to heck with it you know and 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 build more and more and more so um i haven't looked closely enough at that question mike but um you know, I I wonder if if uh, calling this an expansion um, that essentially probably more than doubles the size of the not landfill that would not then meet um, current regulations. Um, I don't know if that would qualify, but you know, if the committee wanted me to, I could do some further re research into that. Is it that site has operated? No, it was a mining operation. Mine. Mm. Also, if we're concerned with distance to residences, like yeah, that right, right, yeah, trips. We're, we're, I mean, we're just replicating what we have. In I guess I, yeah. part of where I'm going is that just you know, like reading through all the comments, and you know, we're we're, we're narrowing down. Like, what's is there an interim solution of some kind at not or immediately adjacent already disturbed properties and places where we already have these activities. Um, rather than going to new ones, that does buy us a little bit more time to start to go through some of these other processes with BLM, et cetera, that we're, we're starting to get kind of boxed in from a time frame perspective. And, you know, um, I think that's frankly something we may have be having to wrestle with here yeah. as a committee in terms of recommendations to the commissioners is something to do with interim solutions. Is there anything else we can do to either extend the existing footprint, expand that in some way, so one thing to keep in mind, I do not believe that DEQ would recognize going across the street as an expansion. They would consider that a new yeah. landfill. With the yeah, public yeah. Public but, road but I, I guess I'm just getting to the bigger question. Okay, yeah. so if that one's taken off the plate, is, what else can be done to extend the life, if anything, of not landfill? Yeah. I mean, and have, does that, do we need to take a, a little bit 
an additional look at that in some way. Yeah, the, um, to get more capacity, you have to go higher. And mm -hmm. the, the, the county made a conscious decision to limit the height of not landfill to what was the maximum building height limit in, in Bend at the time. It was just shortly after I started and we're working. Like nine stories now. And, and well, I know, yeah. <laughs> but, and, you know, to, so that, that, that also preserves the neighbors behind not landfills view of the, of the mountains as well. And we go, we go higher than we would impact that as well. That, that, yeah, that's, um, that decision may or may not have to come depending on how this process proceeds, whether we have to eke out a little bit more capacity of out of not landfill. Mm -hmm. Uh, didn't you mention earlier that Kirk County said that they'd be amenable to like taking some of our of Deschutes County's waste for like a period of time? They they like did. Uh, um, Tim, you had those conversations. So I, I think the thinking was that if we were running short on time, you need to buy some time. That diverting resident waste yeah. to Kirk County would, you know, that's twenty five percent mm -hmm. of the waste, so you could buy some time by doing that. Pretty. I mean, it's almost the same thing. Great shot. Redmond Transfer Station, Crook County is not what that is to not. Yeah. So it's not that big of an impact. But obviously, we would be a tip fee to Crook County if we go that way. Um, but that would but buy us. I think that's probably the first thing we would look at. We mm -hmm. can then offer some waste connections. So that's a landfill in the Dallas. That on a temporary basis, if we needed to, they'd be happy to take some. So we have options, but. Um, there, there are options if if this process that we're we're doing here is stalled. Yes. Yeah, I'd like to make one point as well. Um, I was the director of the department for thirty five years, but I want to stress starting out here that today I'm digital from citizens. Mm -hmm. Nothing I can say today will bind the county on anything. Okay, that's what we're here. So so I've heard a lot about. The impact to recreational activities on some of these properties, um, displacing current uses, things like that. We're looking for 250 acre landfill footprint, and the management plan says another 250 acres for buffer. And if it was me, I'd buy a full section, 650, or as much as we could get, you know. But the thing to remember is that we're displacing whatever's going on on 250 acres. So if we have 800 acres of buffer, um, we can be thinking about ways of increasing recreational opportunities in our buffer. So parking, maybe water, you know, um, <laughs> freezing. So, you know, that land out there on the GI or, or it's DSL land out there, way out there, you know, it's 800 acres. You know, it's got a, a lease on it that's hard to break, but maybe it won't be so difficult to say, you can still graze over 600 acres. We, we just want to take this small portion on that big chunk. So there's opportunities there, okay, uh, potential. And that's a that's a policy decision by the board that they'll have to make. So don't, don't take my word that that's something that could happen. <laughs> but I just point out that that big buffer doesn't necessarily mean it's no man's land and nobody can go on there, right? Uh, it's a landing spot for the for the hang line, you know, water for horses, you know, parking so that um, mountain bikers can have access, you know, in that buffer. <laughs> Thank you, Tim. Okay. Yeah, Dwight. Yeah, I I just wanted to note, and I, I dropped it into the uh, into the chat here, but you know this goes back to the distance to residences. So within our within the criteria, we have it broken down to you know less than one quarter mile, which is quote unquote fatal flaw between a quarter mile and one mile and then greater than one mile. So we can we can also count up the residences. We can also do, you know, just for informational purposes, kind of over and above what we have in the criteria, just you know, the number of residences between one mile and three miles, for instance. And that would give a little bit more information on these sites to uh, you know, for uh, for decision makers to determine, you know, which one looks the best from that standpoint. Need to communicate. Yeah. Yeah. Susanna, are you on the line? I am. Yeah. I don't think I can unmute my. Uh, there we go. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, hi, everyone. I'm Susanna Jolber. I'm part of the um, project team on this. And just a quick update on public outreach. Um, 
We've been doing um, a fair amount over the past couple months. Um, we have the project website website up. Um, we've been doing board of commissioners updates, community group briefings and events. Um, and Chad, Tim, and Sue from the Solid Waste Department have responded to over 400 interested parties via email. I think um, if anyone has written in, they've been really quick to respond and given out really good detailed information. And it's probably more than 400 now. I don't know, we should probably update that, but um, they're probably gonna continue to do that. So um, it's just been fantastic. Um, as we've gotten new information from people and continued stakeholder engagement, um, the list of sites have been pared down. So, um, you know, the project team and the county has been listening. That's where the FAA um, recommendations came from. And um, the list of sites getting narrow are just through more engagement and property owners not being interested in things like that. Um, the project team recently met with um, ODFW and U.S. Fish and Game, um, and we're continuing to do that with more of the agencies now that we're down to a smaller list of sites, um, potentially adding those additional BLM sites that people have been um, requesting. And we're also getting ready. I don't think I can share it now, but we're going to be launching the story map we've talked about a few times. We were waiting till after this meeting so we could get sort of some firm information or guidance on um, the list of sites being pared down. Um, and now we have that. So we're working on getting it translated to Spanish, um, but that will have interactive GIS maps that folks can drill down and see roads and different features. Um, so people have been asking about that. So I think that'll be really helpful. Um, so go ahead. Uh, Ryan, or I don't know who's running. Okay, great. Um, so each each couple of weeks or months, um, the county's been compiling all the comments and the nature of the comments that we've been receiving. This is just through January, but you can see the larger the words are, um, the more the, the topic has been mentioned. Um, so these are just the things we've been hearing about, and we'll continue to do that um, throughout the process. And I think that's it. Oh, uh, next steps. I don't know. I can I can take this if I'll go ahead and take it since I'm talking. Um, so we're we're the project team is continuing to do focused area screening on those um, three remaining sites and technical analysis of those. Um, we'll have SWAC meetings. That's this one February, and then in March we're hoping to have the list of finalist sites, and we're already down to three, so we're pretty close. I think um, we'll be doing a parallel screening as Dwight and or as Chad and the rest of the team were talking about on those BLM sites. At the same time, we're tentatively planning on a project open house on April 6. We may end up moving that a little bit just based on those um, additional sites and how conversations are going with the BLM. Um, and from there, the team will be doing on-site cultural work, geotech evaluations, um, and, and additional assessments on those finalist sites. Um, at that point, we'll be doing more targeted outright reach to those affected property owners. And as you know, we showed in the roadmap earlier, the finalist site will be chosen by the board in spring of 2024. Um, so that that's it. Go to the next slide. I'll hand it back to Chad. Thank. <clears throat> Thank you, Susanna. Um, so we're at the adjourn slide here. Any questions, follow-up discussion? Any anyone on the committee would like to have? I'm just point. a little unclear on how. So if if next meeting next month we're supposed to have, it seems it seems um, like we're going to have three sites that don't have fatal flaws right now, and then there's this uh, side conversation with BLM happening. Yeah. Um, does it make sense for us to keep going through like with these three sites if there's potentially other sites that are going to come online that it seems um, might be great options? And I just wonder like how we uh, navigate like those two parallel timelines. I know it's hard for you to speak to like the ability to navigate with BLM, just recognizing that um, just kind of wanting to take a pause there. Yeah, you know, that that's that's the crux of it here. You will hopefully uh, Commissioner Chang will have some good information for us as well as some real people we can start having conversations with the BLM on. I'm hoping to have a, a bit more de detailed information at that the March meeting. So when, when Commissioner Chang came up with this concept of, of talking with our, our elected representatives, the, the kind of the what we were looking at was we'll continue with the process that we've embarked on here and we can on ramp those uh, those uh, BLM sites if if 
Commissioner Chang and us are successful in, in getting something. You know, one of the things with those, um, we need a we need a pretty hard commitment from BLM. If if they're if we're not going to be able to acquire property for some period of time here, uh, we need to make sure BLM is is solid with us on being able to do that. Especially the concept I spoke on the. Uh, um, the uh, Pal Butte Highway site, if we were to acquire the 80 acres of private property out there, begin operations there to buy us time until BLM goes through their process. If we do that and BLM all of a sudden says, no, we're not going to do it, we're, we're stuck. We, we, we have not, we've, we've started a landfill operation without anywhere to go here. So yeah. we, we need a pretty solid commitment then before we're going to start um, expending a lot of time and resources on those. We're, we're looking at them from the, from the essentially the broad and somewhat focused screening process at this point. That's relatively straightforward to do with, you know, with online GIS resources, things like that. Um, but uh, yeah, we need, we need some, we need to have these conversations with BLM before I can really you know, commit ourselves to what that timeline might look like. Thank you. Yeah. I have a question too. Um, Susanna mentioned we're down to three sites. But on this list, we've talked about more than three. And I know we, we mentioned that some of those ones farther east are problematic. And so I've kind of heard they're likely coming off. But I'm just trying to be clear, like, are those off the table or are they not? And we heard some good ideas from Tim about yeah. the grazing rights. And so I'm just I'm kind of confused about to what extent we're still looking into those or if they have at yeah. this point been removed. The, the comments from GI Ranch, I, I, I at this point, I'd say those those two, those are the furthest east are, are off the list. Okay, but what about the DSLs? You know, I'll have to have further conversation with DSL. And they have, so one, one of the, not to throw stones at other agencies, but, you know, I, I did reach out to DSL talking about a piece of property they own on the uh, adjacent to the, the Highway 97 site, the BLM site there, asking what, it, what are your flags, comments, ideas, thoughts on acquiring that piece of property. I think I sent that that email out in early January. I've not heard back from them on that, so. Okay. Um, yeah, it would just be good to make sure we're like super clear, like when something's officially off the list, like yes, that's like documented. This one's off the list, and that's why. Yeah. Instead of like, it feels like they're slowly trickling off in some cases without it being super clear. Yeah, and that's kind of the case with, with DSL. It's it's just the challenge of trying to work with some of these public agencies. No, it's hard to get hold of people. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, the ones that are still definitely in play, if I'm understanding right, Moon Pit. The Golden Basin, the two Ross sites Correct. on the, today's presentation. Yes. Right. And DSL still has a little bit of traction, but it's it's slipping. Just because of the difficulty with the leases. That and those commitments. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the concept that, that Tim Shimke advanced here, whether or not that's something we could pursue, whether we could acquire the property, but continue to honor the grazing rights. Right. Yeah. On yeah. some, but not all. Yeah. You have other conflicts there. Mm. Yeah. So the, you have three or four of those, and then you have um, <clears throat> the three possible additions. Potential, yes. I was just thinking that all of those will involve the BLM in some way, whether it be grazing allotments, um, you know, all the way to acquisition. Yep. Yeah. You're absolutely right. And they, they've been a difficult agency to, to have a real conversation with. They really have been. I just want to say one thing, if I could. Sure. Um, I would encourage you to keep looking for additional sites to add to the whole list. So you don't get yourself boxed into too few sites that potentially could also get eliminated in the future when you do detailed research on the site. It's a good point, but we do have to get down to a short list of sites. Yeah. Can I ask the committee on the on behalf of the mills and landowners, when considering the Ross site, uh, would you focus more on the east sites versus the west? You're you're asking us to do that. That's what. Yeah. You're... With like, I know the Ross sites are in consideration. Mm -hmm. um, out of the east and the west sites. The least amount of impact on the that there is going to be the east. Side. So that's that's all that I that I would request is just kind of focus more on the east than the west. Yeah, that west side is directly right next to, you know, the, these two sections of land that have 130 tax slots on them, and it's just right there. Yeah. 
Yeah. That's and kind of what he's saying. Yeah. 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 Okay. I think if you need to take more time and adjust the schedule a bit to add a few more sites on your list, you should do that. And and shouldn't have a hard deadline of March to you know only have you know few sites. Maybe you take one more month to see if it gets more. So keep keep your eyes open. That's exactly so the process. Don't box yourself in. That's exactly the process we're going through. Thank because you. The open house is going to be in April, right? Correct. I'm That's assuming a, a recommendation from us to the commissioners is coming after that. Yeah, we're, we're, it's set on the timeline. Right. I don't yeah. think we make a recommendation until next month. Correct. Yeah, right. yeah. The, 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 the recommendation that the committee will make is is for a site to proceed. But we're not making a recommendation on doing the detailed analysis on three to five sites. I thought that was our first recommendation. Well, that doesn't that would that doesn't require board authority. We don't, we don't have to make a recommendation to the county, Board of County Commissioners on these three sites. We'll certainly do an update okay, with them. But as a, as a committee, is it not our job to say that we think you should go forward with looking at these three to five sites Correct. in the detail? Okay, so our yeah. first yeah. big decision yeah. point. That by next month then, like, or we'll after, motion, yeah. like to move forward with these three to five sites, or do you see it as a more general discussion? Well, I, 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 I think we'll want to get a recommendation and agreement from the committee that we'll proceed with three to five sites at the next meeting. Okay. So then what's that's the point of the April meeting then? It's, it's well, it's, that's an open house. To, to do what? So similar to what we did with the salt waste management plan, there was a, a an evening meeting that the public was invited to, do to, to, to see what we're up to. But it's not it's not to take input on that final decision by this group about moving forward with those three to five no, sites. No, it's an open house uh, yeah. information sharing. Yes, maybe this is what Mike is getting at. If it's a real, if you really want to hear from the public, maybe <coughs> the three to five site recommendation from this committee ought to come at the April meeting. After that, I mean, that would be my. That's actually what I thought we were doing. I thought we were going to hear from the community. You know, once it's like, okay, these are the three to five that are on the final, and then. Mm -hmm. There's one, sort of one more chance for people to weigh in, and then we sort of make the, the, the final. Okay, we're beginning the next phase on these. I also sites. think that extra, yeah, like formal public comment on those yeah. five, on the potential five sites. Right. Factor that in. Right. And also, you might need we might need that extra month anyway with the BLM business. Yeah. I, I, it'd be nice if the BLM process we were on track with them within yeah, a month or two, but I, I can't make that promise just based on my experience with them. Again, we see what Commissioner Chang has to say. If if a, if a Congressman Wyden's gonna call somebody, uh, Ferris or somebody at the BLM and say, hey, you get on the phone and you talk to these people right now, then that'd be great, but I don't think that's the way it's gonna work. Yeah. But I guess it encourages not to, you know, repeat, I guess what was happening a little bit with the city an aside, but I've gone to a couple of their road meetings. There's two of us at the table. We can yeah, two of their road <laughs> meetings, and I found several of us sitting out in the hall saying all they wanted to do was tell us what they're doing. They didn't care who what we thought. And um, I don't want to repeat that here. Yeah, I mean, that's always an activation in any kind of public. Yeah. Meeting. But I it mean, was I, obvious the way that people were, the consultants and all were coming across, this is what we're going to do on this intersection. And, uh, well, what about this? Not, this is what we're going to do on this intersection. Well, I, I would hope that's not the perspective you have here. I mean, we, yeah. you know, when we, when we went through the site criteria development, we definitely heard, and we discussed this with the committee at several meetings before we brought it to the commission, and the commissioners had an opportunity to weigh in it as well. Um, I mean, we're we're hearing loud and clear the the, the wildlife concerns on anything east of, of Bend. Um, we certainly heard loud and clear from the sites west of uh, the wildlife areas uh, on residential impacts. So, um, you know, the, um, Tim and I have responded to probably 700 or more uh, email comments at this point. Um, you know, so we are following the process that, that the committee and the commissioners agreed to and established here. Um, and I, kind of by, by default, we're, we're sites are dropping off by not by any decision made by the, the committee here but uh, just, just the, the the realities of what those sites look like there we're you know we're getting down to that short list by default yeah, it kind of seems to me like by the next meeting the only different information though is maybe discussion with dsl and whether those dsls are on the list. I, ideally something from the blm on those other sites but we mm -hmm. have no idea right yeah so it's like we'll only have so much more information by next month but 
already we're down to like three to four sites mm -hmm. if the DSLs are off and the right. BLMs are not on. Yeah, I would, I I would like to know a little bit about what BLM has to say about the Moon Pit site. I mean, so would I? Well, <laughs> yeah. yeah, it just seems like it's a waste of our time to go forward without um, some kind of input from them. I mean, I sort of maybe understood what I heard from the person from Fish and Wildlife, but it just in terms of uh, just general issues that are going to come up from them, should they get to a point where they're quote unquote having to make some kind of decision, it, it seems like they can at least weigh in on that. Otherwise, what's the point? Yeah, it it, it was it seems somewhat ironic uh, Emily's comment that well they don't want to weigh in until the the matter is before them. Well. The, the process we've been looking at a lot of sites that are adjacent to BLM but from a partnership perspective they need to weigh in sooner than that. I, I I agree I agree yeah well they can give us the rules these are the you know what our guidelines rules and things are in our manual yeah they might not be able to advocate we think you ought to take this side and not this one yeah I mean I I'm I'm you know, no the rest of you think but when I I thought we were doing what I said which is we were waiting till after the April input meeting and that's mm -hmm. when our that makes better sense to me from a process perspective. I agree with you. There has been a lot so far, but it's sort of one more chance for people to, and yeah. you can kind of lay out, these are the things that are on the table. Here's the pros, here's some of the issues that come up mm -hmm. and just get a sense of where people are. Yeah. And then we make a decision about it. Dwight has his hand up too. Um, yeah. Yeah, it, I, I just wanted to, to note here, just kind of as a, as a process point, um, you know that this was really identified as a as an informational meeting. Um, not to say that it has to be that, but you know, and rather have have it more as drawing comments from the from the public as well as from the SWAC. Um, but it, it may be best just to um, shelve the April meeting at this point. Have have the SWAC meeting next month. SWAC may come back and just say, well, you know, we need to, we want to spend a little bit more time reviewing this, you know, and so forth, ha and have an April SWAC meeting kind of consummate, you know, the, the list, because at that point, we will have more information from BLM likely, and be able to, as, as uh, Chad points out, uh, see which sites might be able to, to uh, um, on-ramp on into the process. And at which point we'd be able to say, okay, this is the final package. I don't think we're going to have that point necessarily at, at the uh, um, March 21st meeting. We may, but we, we my guess is we probably won't, and that it might make more sense to uh, to use the April SWAC meeting as kind of a final uh, meeting to just kind of pull this all together. And then that's our, our kind of marching orders for going forward with the, uh, with the focus site investigations. That's just kind of my thoughts on this, you know, given um, how public comment has come in so far, which has been really good and robust. And I, and I think it's, it's been very valuable for us as a, as a team, um, consultant team, and I think to the county as well, but also to the SWAC and um, really wanting to make sure that in whatever we do for meetings here and public in, in input, that, you know, we're really using it for the process and getting that um, fully, fully part of our engagement on the process. So I don't know. I, I just throw that out there, you know, because I think what, what you're saying, Mike, is that, you know, this needs to be a substantive meeting, the one on the 6th. Is it going to be substantive or is it better to have, to have the SWAC and I have another meeting? And maybe it is an evening meeting so you get more people to it. Uh, to you know, evaluate the the final sites or get your in, get input from the public on the final sites. I also think if the April meeting, if it's meant to be informational and not for public input, which I think is that's fine. That can be part of an important part of a public process too. It would it would almost make sense to me to wait until we have more of the detailed mm -hmm. screening done on those sites, so that by the time we're doing that meeting, people because at this point there's just not that much to share other than like. These are potential sites. We don't know what's going to be on them exactly. And I think it can be frustrating, especially if it's so close to our decision point. What happens with informational meetings is you get a lot of help, you get a lot of input. And so if you don't have any way of figuring out how to build that in, it can just be frustrating for kind of all involved. And I guess in my mind, it should either be, as Mike said, an opportunity for community to give more input on the final potential sites or kind of separate it from this 
this juncture and maybe do it in six months down the road when we have information to share about the five sites, because I think that would be uh, helpful for people too, if they can see you know, 800 acre, acre parcel, but this is where the actual site would yeah. be. These are the different components we're thinking might be a, a better time to be sharing information out than just like, here's basically the information that people have if they've been following, yeah. which is what we would have by April, right. it seems like yeah. to me. So anyway, I don't you know, it's almost like everyone's got different process ideas, but that's just kind of what I'm thinking yeah, in I, terms of- I think you're making it. Yeah, I agree with you, Cassie. Well, we could make the decision on the April meeting, public meeting at the March meeting. Could we, we, we certainly could, could. yeah. You had two people and, really wanting to make a comment for a while. Uh, Linda, Linda first. Yeah. Linda. Number, Sanford, you did. I would suggest before you recommend the three to five properties, you physically go out yeah, and look yeah. at each one of them. Mm -hmm. Because, um, you know, and, until you physically see the property, you're not going to appreciate whether or not it's going to be able to work. And at least in the case of Murder Dead <laughs> Evil, it's a fence property been in operation since 96 it's going to be hard for you to fully appreciate the size of the feet. And the same is going to be true on these BLM sites as well and so uh, I, I think it would be very advantageous for you to be able to say not only have we done all the work with the studies and reports we've actually physically looked at it and then we can recommend these sites or they may drop off even before we get to that so and unfortunately they're all fair they're all within yeah. each other. I think at the last meeting I suggested a driving tour. Out of that or we go as it's groups that are smaller than the quorum. <laughs> and um yeah, like two or three groups or something. Well, it's not a decision meeting. I don't know why we you still can't well, I think legally an attorney there, but I think um <laughs> you, you get into quorum issues is if you could somehow just ha have a discussion that leads to a but at least to a decision. Can have a work session. Mm. <laughs> Can't we? I don't think so. Lane County got taken so. to court on that. Real quick, <clears throat> why did the West Butte LLC fall off the list? He called me and said, no, nah, we're not interested. Hmm? Yeah, it was a direct hmm. conversation with him. Yeah. Can I just make one more point? Yes, absolutely. Um, you tell me here advocates for looking for more sites. And you guys have heard a list of 13. That's the first public information that went out. But prior to getting that one, we looked at every property in the county, of 250 acres or more, um, with the exception of federal, the liver forest service. And we had well over a hundred potential sites. I think it was by that 250 acre um, it, was four, it was 406. <laughs> 406. 406 sites, yes. So so everything has been looked at to a certain extent. Everything that dropped off before we heard the 13 that was proposed were really fatal flaw things. In other words, you know, wetlands or or um, fault lines or too close to residences or you know, there was 250 acres, but it was in the shape of an L. So there's no way you could put a footprint in there. You know, so those things all took place, and we you know, we came down to thirteen before we even saw that list. So we have some extensive information. I just wanted to um, make a point on the uh, the Moon Pit uh, site, and uh, being that there was talk about the uh, Badlands Wilderness Trailhead right there. Um, there's actually another. Uh, uh, access point um a trailhead access point that's on the highway that's about uh, maybe one or two miles mm -hmm. towards bend it's mm -hmm. called the flat iron trail uh head um that access and, and it's actually a lot more popular um i see <laughs> a lot more cars there than over the badlands i i recreate in that whole area quite often as well so um that there's still a very good access point for the uh, Badlands area, uh, there's, a, there's a couple other two on the on the eastern side, but the, but the main side um, on Highway 20, that's not gonna you know go away. Um, yeah, Stephanie, can can we do a tour if it's a work session and it's not a decision meeting without violating a bunch of public meetings? <laughs> 
<clears throat> officially yet. Right. Yeah. Uh, again, Stephanie Marshall, Assistant Legal Counsel. Um, yeah, I I don't know that for certain, and so I would want to take a look at that. Um, you know, I mean, I don't know if it would need to be noticed. Um, with with you know, I mean, if you're you're taking in information that's that's leading to you know recommendations, decisions by the committee. So that aspect of it, yes, you know that that that's a, a specific yes. I don't know if if it can occur with um, the notice, you know, at least posted on the website, that kind of a thing. So if you all would would give me you know the rest of the day or you know early tomorrow to to get you an official answer that I feel confident about, that would be great. <clears throat> yeah. 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 Uh, is, I, I mean, I, I tend to agree. It would it seems important that we visit it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Oh, one way or another, a draw, yeah. by ourselves or in yeah. small groups that are. Yeah. Now that forum. we're down to just a few, especially. Right. And if we do small groups, I think that's something. Do under quorum. We Tim and I can yeah. logistically do, right. and we can put we do it that way. Six people in our company car. You know, okay. could, what is a quorum for our group? Um, well, oddly enough, we have an even number of committee members. <laughs> Six, or something like that. Six sure. is the quorum. Yeah, that's yeah. When I'm when I'm taking roll call, I'm sweating when we're not getting up to six here. So yeah. I, I want to say one more quick thing, um, because the SWAC isn't the one making the ultimate decisions. You know, it's a committee that's that's getting. To, I mean, the the decision maker is the Board of County Commissioners. So, the Public Meetings Act laws might not be quite as as clear on that front, which is why I'm a little hesitant to say you're okay, go for it. Um, so, I just kind of want to look into that um, for for committees um, that perform the function that you guys do. So, thanks. Yeah, getting to move pit in the Roth property pretty straightforward um and uh, there's there's no access to these potential blm sites and we could drive by and kind of point it's out in that area there a golden basin is i have not driven out that road in in some time it's you it's, can get pretty close to it I it, yeah there's a fence you can open and yeah it doesn't sound like a yeah. <laughs> Don't let the cows out. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you got yeah. We'll see if we can work. We can, we'll see if we can work on a real trip. Uh, uh, whether it's a collectively together or in small groups, we'll wait and hear what Stephanie finds for us here. So, so yeah, I I do have to get to a meeting. Yeah, I think we all probably need to wrap up. Um, when we get down to three different properties, is there any kind of provision to write letters to all the different property owners that? might not be aware of these meetings. Oh, yeah. Steve mentioned over 120 property owners in the Millican Valley that may be oblivious. When we do a, our short topic. list, we'll we'll do a much larger outreach. We've been kind of arbitrarily talking a mile out. So yeah. Well that's why you want to have extra sites on the list because you might find out later there's going to be all this extra people that find out and so you didn't know about. So you get more feedback as you get into that detailed process of the individual sites. Yeah. Motion to adjourn. Yeah. Second. Thanks everybody. All right. Thank you everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.